Okay, everybody, let's, uh, let's hit the road. Let's get started. It is fantastic to see you all. Welcome to Beaver. Welcome, Rowdies in the room. Welcome to the Rowdies in the family centre next door. Welcome to all of you lovely, quiet people sitting on your sofas uh, with a laptop on your knee. Uh, it's great to see you all in person, online, and however you're connecting with us this morning. Now, to get started here, you'll see, I know I always, or almost always, make a mess up here at the front, and you're thinking, oh, he's not, not, not only, he, he's hardly even started, and he's made a mess already. He's, uh, he's brought his soap bag along with him and left everything scattered all up at the front but this is your visual aid to tell you about our harvest this year which is not next Sunday but the Sunday after today fortnight is going to be our beaver harvest celebration we like to do harvest a little bit differently in beaver um, can anyone remember what our theme was last year when you were trying to remember what to bring along your harvest gifts what do we call it there was pants what was it called what was the name Drop your pants in church, best name for a harvest ever. I don't think we've got quite as good a name this year. But yeah, last year, you remember, there were washing lines of pants and socks hanging up at the front, and we were bringing pants and socks and gloves and all kinds of things. And this year, again, we've got a kind of a bit of a unique little theme. This year, we are calling it ooh, The Cleaning Cupboard, and we are asking for cleaning bathroom and kitchen essentials. These are going to be given out through all nations to refugees and asylum seekers. Uh, just the basics uh, of, uh, of household and personal hygiene. So when you're shopping for things to leave off in our harvest trolley this year, I thought um, just to help you remember what's what and what it is you're looking for in the supermarket, I thought we would play a little bit of a guess the advert. So uh, here we go, number one. Shout out. <laughs> That's good. I love, we're not the BBC. We can actually, we can actually name uh, the brand names uh, here in Beaver. So yes, uh, the good old, the Andrex puppy. Uh, you got it first time. So uh, toilet rolls and tissues is the first thing that you might be looking for. So let's just see the end of the advert because it's lovely. That's a nice way to start the service with a warm, fuzzy feeling inside. I don't think all of these adverts are going to give you such a warm, fuzzy feeling, but that's number one thing to remember for our harvest hampers is toilet rolls and tissues. Okay, next advert. I'm sure there was lots of mud. Turn it up, turn it up. I shook off so much mud. It was here, now it's gone. Every bit, every drop, every inch was gone. And the brand name is? Very good. Every drop, every inch was gone. Miracles. Flash. <laughs> okay, very good. So flash or anything, kitchen cleaner, surface sprayer, anything like that. Uh, kitchen and bathroom cleaning products is our next thing uh, for, uh, for our harvest hamper. And if, now you're worried already that you're going to have flash stuck in your head, uh, the, the tune in for the rest of the day. My next advert is another kitchen or bathroom cleaning product, but it is an even more of an earworm of a tune. And when I was looking for this, God, I'd forgotten how bad these adverts were. But right, let's see if anyone can finish the song in this lovely advert. Yeah. And are my hands soft? Well, not as soft as Mummy's hand, but that's because you don't do as much or snap as Mummy does. Now, hands that do dishes can feel soft. Sing it up, sing along. Oh, beautiful. Let's just hear it one more time. Oh, that's quite beautiful, wasn't it? Yes. I think we had harmonies from the choir. I got maybe a chorus of angels was joining in there. That sounded really good. So there we go. So right, kitchen and bathroom cleaners, toilet rolls and tissues. Uh, the next one uh, I haven't got an advert for because there wasn't one that I could show without getting all embarrassed. But <laughs> that kind of thing. And then next one. Oh, this is a great advert. And the advert is for? Can anyone remember? There was a hashtag? 
right? Uh, uh, yeah, you're, yeah, you're in the right kind of direction. So, has anyone ever used the hashtag Pampers Poo Face? I wonder, has anyone, like not it, just of you, but of anyone ever, has anyone actually used that? But yes, Pampers, nappies and creams uh, and all of that kind of stuff. And then one more. We're going back in time now a little bit. This is one for uh, Adrian to remember. Sound. Sound. The problem of dandruff finally solved. So I just mean it's an old advert. I don't mean that you have to solve this problem. But yes, solved. What is, uh, what is the product that has solved this problem? Very good. The problem of dandruff finally solved. Not just washed away for a few days. Finally, for millions, the problem of flaking dandruff can be solved. With just regular use of Procter & Gamble's new Wonder Shampoo, Head & Shoulders. New Wonder Shampoo. So, I don't know, have we got, have we got Head & Shoulders up here? We've got, we've got a wide variety. Uh, herbal essences, I'm sure, is just as good. So we're not insisting that you stick to these brand names particularly, but so there are loads of ideas for you to roam the aisles of Tesco's or Sainsbury's or insert your own supermarket here. Toiletries, shampoo, soap, shower gel, deodorant, toothpaste, toothbrushes we've got here. Toilet rolls, tissues, sanitary products, uh, pampers, creams, all the rest of it. So have you got, you've got it by now, haven't you? This is what we are collecting for harvest this year for all nations to distribute to refugees and asylum seekers. Um, I just think that's a really, it's a lovely thing. They're basics, they're household essentials in some ways, but uh, more than essentials, they're, um, they're essentials of dignity in some ways. There's something really powerful and profound about just being able to feel that you're clean and that you smell nice. Uh, that's, uh, that's actually a real gift to people to give them the resources to be able to do that. So that is our harvest appeal this year and you can leave the stuff off anytime today next week uh, on harvest sunday itself uh, but we'll be gathering it all together this day fortnight uh, for our harvest service sound like a plan fantastic up on your feet let's get started so our first song today is one to kind of blow the cobwebs away uh, my lighthouse you're welcome to join in the actions uh, if you'd like you've maybe noticed already only one of our screens is watching this morning so make sure you're all kind of pointing uh, in this direction uh, and father thank you for the joy of being able to gather here together thank you for the fun and the laughter and the friendship in this room thank you for all the smiling faces surrounding us thank you for the feeling of being part of a family and thank you lord for faith Thank you that you are the light in the darkness. Thank you that you are the one we can trust in and rely on through all the storms of life. And so we raise our voices together now to sing My Lighthouse.
Please take a seat. Well done to everyone who was trying the actions. I love the way in that song there are as many different actions as there are as many different people doing the actions. But just like on primary school sports day, everybody's right. Everybody's a winner. You all looked amazing. Uh, so well done. That was fantastic. Now, uh, later on in our service, we're going to uh, join in communion. We'll tell you all about that when that's getting a little bit closer. Uh, for now, we are going to join in our time of confession. So just as you're sitting there, would you like to close your eyes for one little moment? At the start of the service, we watched a whole lot of adverts. And the whole idea of an advert, it's always just like a little 30-second burst of the actual best of anything. So, you know, you see the, the jacket with no dandruff, or you see the flash wiping away every single stain. You see the thing at its absolute best. And sometimes we wish that our lives were like that. Our lives were like the advert, that we could just show only our best, only when everything is working well, uh, and that we are at our absolute best. But in our time of confession, we take a little moment of honesty before God, and we just say we are not always as advertised. We are not always at our best, and we just bring uh, the things that we know we've said and done and regretted afterwards, we bring them with honesty before our loving Heavenly Father, who always is waiting to pour out forgiveness. So the words will pop up on the screen, uh, and we say our confession together. Most merciful God, most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, help us to amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. And may the God of love and power forgive us and free us from our sins, heal and strengthen us by his spirit, and raise us to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. Now, at this point, anyone who's heading out for kids gathering uh, or for hybrid, if you would like to head out this Door, that, this, that, that door, that door. Ignore me. Whatever I tell you, do the opposite. Uh, so yes, if you're heading out, have fun. Guys, have a fantastic time. So if you'd like to head out through that door there, that would be fantastic. <laughs> of us, the remnant who remain, we're going to join together now in our creed, in, uh, just as we sang in my lighthouse, that this is the light uh, in the darkness of our world and sometimes in the darkness of our lives. Uh, the light is this faith that we share. So we say together, I believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. 
He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Okay, I think we're ready. Okay. Let, let me read you what comes just before that. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise person who built his house on a rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it's had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish person who builds his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Now, what words are being talked about there? Whoever hears these words of mine, that is at the end of Matthew chapter 7. And if you know that part of the Bible, Matthew chapter uh, 5, Matthew chapter 6, and Matthew chapter 7 are what's known as the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus has been talking about a wide range of things. And when he gets to the end of that Sermon on the Mount, he finishes with this, therefore everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise person who built their house on the rock. Now, it wasn't too many years ago I noticed in that that the rock is not the words of Jesus. The, the rock is the words of Jesus put into practice. Whoever hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like someone who builds their house on a rock. So it's not just the words. It's not even knowing what the words are. It's the words worked out through a life, through words, through activity, through what we do with our lives. That's the rock. And then we, we come to the end of that, it says in Matthew chapter 7, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. Now, not because it was interesting, or he told good stories, although I'm sure that was interesting, or because he used new words, or anything like that. It was because he taught with real authority, quite unlike their teachers of religious law. So, what's being pointed out here is that there's something about this Jesus, and not just the things that he teaches, but the authority that comes with it, not like the other teachers of the law of the, of the time. Now, what was different between Jesus and the other teachers of the law? I'm going to use the word 
authenticity. When something is authentic, it means it's genuine. It's the real deal. It's not a pretend copy of something. And the difference between Jesus and the other teachers of the law is that the words Jesus spoke matched the life that he lived and matched the attitudes that came out when he met people, when he walked at the situations. It was like it, it, was, like it was all woven together in a way that it was just the same thing. Unlike the other teachers of the law who taught about the law and about rules you must keep and about ways you must be, but all of it without love, all of it without grace, all of it without mercy, and yet the law was all about that. So there's something about Jesus that is entirely authentic. It's like it's the real thing when it's Jesus. And isn't that always one of the criticisms of the church? is that we don't quite live up to the things that we claim to believe or the things we claim to say. And it's probably, let's, let's stop pretending. It's not probably like us, it is like us. And I can speak to you with great authority on that, right? Because I know my life does not live up to the things I claim to believe and the things that I even tell you to believe or tell you to do, right? Uh, I, like everybody else, fail at all of those things. But it's also partly authentic to admit that we fail. That adds to our authenticity. Now, Jesus didn't have to do that because he didn't fail at it. But for us to not pretend that we're, you know that phrase, holier than thou, or that we're better than everybody else, or that we're better than the people around us, that is the not authentic. But when we admit, and Chris has already led us in it, and we do it at every service of worship, at some point, we stop and admit that maybe I'm not quite as good as I like to pretend I am. Now, it would be an entirely different uh, story, wouldn't it, if on a Sunday morning, if we invited everybody to shout out all the things, right, that they feel that this week and all the things they're not so good at, all the things they've watched, all the things they've said, uh, all the things they've passed on to other people that they shouldn't have, and all of that. That would, that would be a much more... Would, why don't we try that some Sunday? <laughs> That would be an authentic service of worship, wouldn't it, by the time we got into it? Uh, wow, there'd be a whole, it could be a long session <laughs> as well, right? Later on, uh, so that's what we're thinking about this book, because it will end up, because the, the teaching of Jesus uh, since the apostles has been known as this book and the stuff that is in it. Uh, so let me take you on to something that Paul wrote, and he wrote this to... Um, Timothy. And Timothy was a young, uh, let's describe him as a young clergy person, uh, because Timothy is now leading the church in Ephesus. But one of the things Paul says to him is, don't let people look down on you because of your youthful age. So he's clearly a young person. Let's, let's put him around uh, leaving school, student, starting work sort of age. Let's, let's put him around 20-ish, something like that. And Paul says to him, as for you, because Paul's like a, some sort of spiritual father to him, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know these, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Now, I have known these verses for years, and I have never noticed before that little phrase, it's the second line to the third line, because you know those from whom you learned it. I've always thought Paul was telling Timothy to make sure and cling to the scriptures that he has learned from his infancy. But he also says, because you know those from whom you learned it. And when I stopped and noticed that, I thought, okay, Paul's probably talking about himself. Um, but then I spotted something else, two chapters early in, earlier in Timothy. Recalling your tears, speaking to Timothy, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which you first lived, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded now lives in you also. Isn't that fabulous? Granny and Mommy were part of the training up of this young man who's now leading a major church in the New Testament, Ephesus, Ephesians. 
because you know those from whom you learned it. We're meant to learn these scriptures from each other, from the people around us. And that doesn't mean that you necessarily have to sit down and listen to sermons from each other, but that if we're living authentic Jesus or trying to live increasingly authentic Jesus-type lives, there should be bits of this that we start to see. And you've probably been doing it for many years where you see things in people and you think, that truly is the life of Jesus coming out in them. But like granny and mommy to Timothy, uh, part, of the, part of the call even through the Bible is to live out the authentic life of Jesus that we see in each other. And if you look around, you will see that. You will see the person who cares, the person who loves, the person who forgives. And we're not all perfect, so don't go trying to see it in everybody, but try to avoid the admitting I don't see it in everybody. So that, that's judging, yeah. Uh, but how about beginning to notice and see what we see in other people and thinking, I could be a bit more like that. I could learn what's in these Scriptures by seeing the story of the Scriptures lived out in people. So, if you go way back to the house on the rock and everything, one of the, uh, one of the things that they most learned from Jesus was um, that it's not just the words. It's the actions, the activity, the attitudes, the responses to things, that that's where you learn the crucial things when you watch and see how people respond. So, do not follow me down the aisle in Tesco with a trolley, right? Because you will not see the life of Jesus manifest in front of you uh, as people in front spin around with their trolley and bang into you or block the aisle while they have a conversation. And the grace and mercy and peace of Christ just flows out of me, <laughs> okay? Uh, as you think, is this some sort of roadblock? Uh, or what are you doing? You know, right, so, uh, don't follow me around Tesco. In fact, I'm beginning to think, don't follow me anywhere, actually. <laughs> Let's just get past that. And, yeah, go follow somebody else. I was going to say follow Janice. <laughs> no, no, don't, don't follow Janice. Right, okay. <laughs> right. Paul went on to say to Timothy, all Scripture is God-breathed. And what I'm trying to do is inspire you to think about this book. It could be so life-giving to us. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching. There's four things. Teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. But there's a purpose. It's like an apprenticeship so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Right? There's a point to this book. It's so that we're equipped to live this task, this life that we've been called to, to make the difference in our world and in our families, in our work, wherever we are, to to be the difference. So, these things will equip us for that. So, let's do a quick jump through each of those, and then we'll get on to some other things in our service. All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Um, teaching means uh, shaping what we believe and what we think about God and His world. Now, I did grow up in a fairly fiery, hot uh, parish church, yeah, where our eternal destiny was reminded to us many times, okay? That was just the sort of environment I grew up in. And uh, I have used this story a few times, and I've shown you this picture before. Jesus re-describes God as the prodigal father or the father of the prodigal. This, and it doesn't mean that he undoes everything that went before, but the God that is sometimes imagined and described as harsh and heavy and vindictive and full of vengeance, and I'm coming to get you, is actually the father of the prodigal. And we need to absorb that. Into, it's like it's teaching us. We need to absorb who God is as shown by Jesus Christ in the stories He tells, in the things He does. 
the words he says, and allow that to be teaching. And if you read this book, you will find God described in ways you never thought before. And it will, you know, and when it affects what you think and believe, it starts to affect how you treat others. If I begin to realize that God, that in my willful, selfful, selfish, egotistic sense, I'm opposed to God, and then Jesus says, love your enemies, then I begin to realize, because that's exactly how God loves everyone. He doesn't mind how opposed to Him they are. He doesn't mind how, uh, how bitter they are and how they describe God to others or what they say about the church. God loves even the people who hate Him. He's genuine in that. And that's such a challenge to our understanding then. Well, what should our lives be like? Let's move on. Correcting, rebuking, rebuking. Uh, and rebuking sounds like being told off. Uh, one of the other words that this is translated as is conviction. Uh, and conviction isn't, you know what it is, or what it isn't. I don't need to be told off. I'm perfectly capable of knowing when something's wrong all myself. Uh, I have a wee example of this. I, in my phone, uh, I have a wee app. Oh, you won't be able to see it, so no point in showing it to you. Right, it's too small. I have a wee app called MileIQ, and if I go at more than 20 miles per hour, as long as my phone is in my pocket or sitting beside me, uh, my phone, my MileIQ app assumes I'm driving my car. But I could be in a bus, or I could be in a train, it could be in a plane. Um, and it, what it does is it records every journey that I ever make. And therefore, when you come to filling in your self-assessment for Her Majesty's, His Ma oh, it's His Majesty's, isn't it? Uh, isn't it lucky it starts with an H, <laughs> okay? They don't have to change all the letterheads. So HMRC, when you come around to filling in your tax return, um, I am allowed a certain number of miles that can, is tax deductible, so it reduces the amount of tax that I pay. Uh, so Mile IQ has every journey for the whole year. Now, it's an arduous task. It takes about two hours a year. Uh, and it actually starts at the start of the year, and it pops up a map, the time you started, where you went, and when you got back. Now, every journey, even down to Tesco for, or up to KFC, it's all there, right? <laughs> Doesn't say what you bought, right? Uh, but what you do is you have an option here, to the right for business miles, to the left for personal. So it comes up with a wee map and tells you where you went, and you go, choop, 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 business, 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 personal, KFC. Business, business, personal, down to Tesco, business, personal, business. Till I get to the meeting I went to in Dublin, business. And I'm thinking, this is where the conviction bit comes in. I have a smart pass. I went to Dublin on the train, free. Aha. Uh -huh. I don't need anybody to tell me off about this. Business, mm. Sure, no one will know. Could have been the car. It doesn't say. No, can't. It has to go over this side. It's absorbing the life. So I don't want to sound like I'm wonderfully holy here or anything. But it's absorbing the life of Jesus, of allowing the Holy Spirit to be active in our lives, that that level of conviction you, don't we want that to flow through everything we say and do? You start to speak and think, no, that's not kind. Keep that to myself. That's not a good reaction. No, keep that to myself. That's not business. No one will ever know. Uh, Psalm 51 verse 10. David has committed adultery. He could have got away with it. But something in here isn't sitting right. This is King David in the Old Testament. Psalm 51, have mercy upon me, O God. In verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God. The conviction that this isn't honoring of God and ultimately is cheating someone else. Correcting. Janice, come and tell us your wee story. Okay.
Yes, I love being married, Adrian. You always. <laughs> um, anyway, sorry. I, I want you to go back to 1968 when I was 11 years old and in primary school, and we got this teacher who came called Miss Cassidy, and she was a PE teacher, and I loved her to bits, and she taught me lots of stuff about sport, and she inspired me to be a teacher. Then go on to 1975, so I had managed to work my way far enough to get to um, Stram Millis to train to be a teacher, and learned all the things you had learned to be a teacher. And then 1979, I graduated and came out full of all the new training that we had got in those days that was really cutting edge, I'm sure, but not anymore. But anyway, I couldn't wait to get out to be a teacher. That's what I wanted to do. I'd wanted to do it for years, and I just couldn't wait to get out there and, and do it. Um, but in those days, there were loads of us who came out of Stranmillis, and it was very difficult to get a job. So I had applied for, I mean, I, I, I'm not exaggerating, I'm sure the guts of 100 jobs, been for loads of interviews, and always ended up as the bridesmaid and not the bride. Right, whereas I quite often, in those days they kept you behind and they came out and told you who was runner-up and who got the job. And so quite often they come out and told me I was the runner-up. Um, so that whole year I spent subbing. Now I was very grateful because I only subbed in two schools and did long-term subbing. But at the end of that year, Adrian and I were getting married. And when you get married, you need to have your own money and be able to pay for houses and cars and all of that. And when you're subbing, you don't know when your money's coming in. So I was really getting desperate at this stage, and I could hear this wee voice in my head saying, sure, don't bother being a teacher. Just get another job. It doesn't matter. You can do anything. Um, so I was actually at the point of applying for other jobs. And at that time, I was working in uh, Fort Hill Primary School in Lisburn, and a friend used to take me because she worked in the secondary school, and we used to have to get there really early. So I was always in school very early. And my pattern was to go in, sit in the classroom. I can still see the classroom. It was P2. I can still see some of the children in that classroom because some of them were memorable, and they've stuck with me <laughs> all of that time. Um, but my, my pattern was to go in and read my Bible. That's what I did every morning. So I went in, sat down at the teacher's table, got my Bible out. It was a good news Bible, the one with the pictures at that time, which I read. And so in my head, I was planning to apply for other jobs. I was thinking of the civil service because loads of my friends worked there and that seemed a good job. And I thought that's what I would do. My Bible reading that morning was um, Psalm 11. And it said, the title at the top was Confidence in the Lord. And I'm just going to read you the first verse and a half. I trust in the Lord for safety. How foolish of you to say to me, fly away like a bird to the mountains. Now that may not make any sense to a certain way, but as soon as I read that, the thought came to me, God was saying to me, do you not trust me? Right? You've wanted to be a teacher for years. You've done all the training. You enjoy doing it. Right? Why are you wanting to fly away and do something different? And so... Based on that, um, I'm sure if you went into all the hermeneutics and all of that, that may not mean that at all. But in that moment, that's what that meant to me. And immediately, I just said, right, God, I'm not going to apply for anything else. I'm going to keep filling in those forms. I'm going to keep going for interviews. And you can talk to me later about what happened. But anyway, that's what I did. I didn't apply for any other jobs. I remained on the line of being a teacher. Thank you, Janice. That was great. Now, could I say, of all the girls who were queued up for me, uh, <laughs> you were never the bridesmaid. <laughs> okay. Oh, an extra roasty today. <laughs> right. Finally, training in righteousness is the fourth thing. Um, righteousness is just a big fancy word for right living. Actually, you know, just doing it right, not just doing the right things, but doing things right. We story to illustrate this, and then I'll finish. Way down in the larder in St. Christopher's before we came to Beaver, um, when, we, when we started the, the food bank thing, it became very obvious soon on that uh, because we were trying to grow a faith community in the midst of all of that, it wasn't just about giving food out. We wanted to uh, create something that people could belong to as well. So we, we kind of threw it open to anybody who came as a client to the food bank could become a volunteer and work in it and all of that. 
Uh, and a number of people started doing that, and it came and went. Some people did it for a wee while, others did it for years, and you know, all the usual things. Uh, but um, Tuesday lunchtime, the larder was open every Tuesday morning, was one of the opening times. Every lunchtime on Tuesday, when we closed the doors, uh, all the volunteers were invited to stay for lunch. Homemade soups were made, bread was baked. It was a lovely moment. Uh, and we decided that uh, we, would, we would do training at that. But training wasn't terribly complicated. Training meant a Bible story. But we decided that we would use this wee book uh, to train for righteousness, for right living or right attitudes. And I remember the, the week, uh, somebody had been complaining about, oh, what do you do? You know, people come in here and they try to sneak an extra jar of coffee into their bag when you're not looking or into their pocket of their coat uh, and all of that sort of, you know, so lots of volunteers complaining and moaning about uh, all this. And I remember we sat down this particular Tuesday with the feeding of the 5,000. And we read the story, and nobody was preaching. It's what do you think the story means? What can we learn from it? And all of that. Uh, and when they got to the end, and all the baskets of food were left over after everybody had eaten their fill. And we came to the conclusion that in the heart of Jesus is generosity. Yeah? prepared to let them eat as much as they wanted, and a whole lot left over if you want to take it home. And uh, I said, maybe that's what we as a team of volunteers here in the food bank should be like, filled with generosity. If somebody is in that bad a need that they need a second jar of coffee, why not smile at them and say, yep, have it. Uh, but here was the thing. There was a big guy sitting in the volunteers, and he was a bit rough and ready, to be honest. Uh, I remember hearing a week or two later uh, a new volunteer, him lecturing them about generosity because Jesus was generous. He wasn't claiming any kind of church belonging or any kind of faith. Uh, he was just saying, this is what we do here. We're generous because Jesus was generous. I'm thinking, wow, from a story in that book filled me with uh, enthusiasm for us absorbing this book into our lives and even using it in very natural and easy ways to help others. So I want to finish. In a wee moment, Joanne's going to lead us in our prayers at the end of another week filled with turmoil in our world and probably the beginning of a week that could be filled with turmoil. And then Chris is going to lead us to joining together as the family of God around this table. But could I throw this into the mix? This is a very old prayer from our prayer book. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, help us to hear them, to read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them. That. And you can fill in the end yourself. So that, what will happen to my life? Help us to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them. Joanne, could I invite you to come and lead us in prayer? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Bible and how you speak to us through it. We ask you to give us listening ears to hear, inquiring minds to understand, and open hearts to respond to what you are saying by applying it in our lives. We especially pray for all those in our congregation preparing for confirmation, particularly our young people, as they explore your word and will for their lives. Give wisdom and courage to those who preach and teach your word in this place as they share your message with us. Lord of glory, hear our prayer. Lord God, we pray for your broken world. We pray for peace in all countries of the world and particularly in Ukraine. Stay the hand of those in Russia who would seek to escalate the situation and give wisdom to all involved in trying to secure a peaceful resolution, human rights and democracy. We also pray for politicians in our own country and in Westminster. Father, as people worry about feeding their families and paying their bills, 
We pray decision makers would have a strong heart for social justice and equity. So they make decisions and bring forward policies that improve rather than worsen the lives of the most vulnerable. And as public rhetoric increases about the future of Stormont, we ask that our political leaders approach discussions with a spirit of openness, tolerance and compromise so that solutions for the public good are placed above party political dogma or personal political ambition. Lord of glory, hear our prayer. Creator God, in this harvest season, we give thanks for all the good things that earth provides, including the earth air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat, and the raw materials for the products we need. We are conscious that many across our world cannot afford the necessities of everyday living and therefore go without basic needs being met. So we pray that you would move us to be generous in our giving, including to the harvest appeal, so that all nations can meet the need for basic hygiene products. Lord of glory, hear our prayer. Father, we are conscious that in the current economic crisis, it would be easy for decision makers to prioritize economic growth above social and environmental justice. But as we look around and see a growing gap between the richest and the poorest, and a continuing loss of nature and worsening of our climate, Move the church to raise our voices alongside the growing movement of aid and conservation agencies to hold decision makers to account by highlighting how unsustainable growth is causing growing injustice. Lord of glory, hear our prayer. Father, we ask for your healing for all who are sick or injured. We particularly pray this morning for all those who were killed or injured in the mass shooting at the Thailand Nursery School and in the explosion in Krishla, Donegal. Lord, our hearts weep for the many lives both lost and forever changed, particularly those of children. We ask you to heal the injured, comfort those who mourn, and give strength to all those involved in the emergency response and those now caring for the injured and the bereaved. And we take a moment in silence to remember before God all those known to us who are struggling because of sickness, because of bereavement, because of financial or work or family worries. God of comfort, we ask you to draw close to all those we have named in our hearts. Lord of glory, hear our prayer. And so we bring our prayers to a close and we join together to say the words the Bible has taught us. Our Father, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Joanne. We're going to get ready to receive communion together now. We've thought quite a lot in our service this morning about the, the gap between the advert uh, and the reality or our good intentions and our daily lives. Uh, and so I suppose we want to be honest about that before God as we prepare to receive these symbols of his goodness and his love. So we're going to say together uh, this, prayer, this humble prayer. Uh, we do not presume and the words will pop up on the screens. We do not presume, we do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body 
and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. Now, my team of waiters and waitresses are now about to give out the bread and wine to all of you. You've maybe noticed we're trying this uh, a little bit differently today. You didn't get your little shot glass and your bread as you came in. Uh, We're going to give it out just as we're about to use it. So when you receive your glass of wine and your piece of bread, just keep it in your hands. You're going to be eating and drinking them in one wee minute. Don't eat and drink them yet, uh, but in one wee minute. What we're kind of hoping as we give them out is that it's a little bit like that atmosphere at a big family meal. You know, if you gather together with aunties and uncles and grannies and granddads, there's always that bit uh, at the start of dinner when everyone is kind of serving and helping themselves. Uh, and you're asking, you know, pass the gravy and don't pass me the Brussels sprouts. And there's a little bit of uh, chaos and you're kind of watching the gravy boat make its way around and thinking, don't you dare take all the gravy, auntie. Uh, and you're, uh, you know, there's always just that bit of kind of, um, just that sense uh, that even the, uh, the action of giving it all out is part of being together as a family. So I hope that that is what it feels like for us this morning. Just even the faffle (laughs) of getting a little glass of wine and a little piece of bread out to all of you. We're all a family. Here we are a family. Some of the family are gluten-free and we do have gluten-free bread. And if you don't get a piece of gluten-free bread, just make sure you tell one of your waitresses or waiters uh, that that's what you would like. Uh, And we'll make sure that just as at any good family dinner, uh, we all have enough and we're all ready to share together. So feel part of this family, feel welcome in this family as we get ready to share this family meal. This is the table, not of the church, but of the Lord. It is to be made ready for those who love him and want to love him more. So come you who have much faith and you who have little. You who have been here often, And you who have not been for a long time. You who have tried to follow. And you who have failed. Come not because I invite you. It is our Lord. It is his will that those who want him should meet him here. Okay, so I think we're all ready and supplied with everything we need. And so we now... Tell the story of that night again, a night full of fear and worry about the future. Uh, Gethsemane was just around the corner, and so can you imagine uh, just uh, the the anxiety in the hearts of the people who first received this meal all those years ago? On that night, when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and gave thanks to God. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take Eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so each of you take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. And in the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and gave thanks to God and gave it to the disciples saying, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so together we drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful.
let's stand together. to sing and what a thing to believe standing here in the midst of us Jesus is here at our family meal he is part of our family and also the king and the uh, the lord of our family but he is standing here in the midst of us he is with us he is beside us he is amongst us what a beautiful thing and so we pray together, and the words will pop up on the screen there. Almighty God, Almighty God, Eternal Father, we have sat at your feet, learned from your word, and eaten from your table. We give you thanks and praise for accepting us into your family. Send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Accepting us into your family. May each one of us believe to the core of our being, believe the truth of us, of that this morning. We are in, in this family. So let's raise our voices once more. In Christ alone, my hope is found. Thank you. 
So, Lord, may we stand and walk into this week in your power and in your path. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit go with us this day and forevermore. Amen. 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 Gang, I have some good news as we get ready to leave this morning. Yes, you can take your seats if you want, but that's not the good news. If you look outside, you will see... The dark storm clouds are a gathering, not just metaphorically, but literally. So for the winter, for autumn and winter, we are going to try um, moving our coffee time into the hall. And this um, is a whole other world of joy than it would have been before our big renovations this summer. So huge gratitude to everyone who had the foresight to put in our, our lovely acoustic panels and the repainting job. It look, just looks beautiful. So it's going to be a really nice place for us to gather and have coffee and a bit of chat. So this involves asking you to not rush off because one of the good things about having the coffee just outside the door was that you could not escape even if you wanted to just dash straight home you had to kind of fight your way through all of these uh, enthusiastic coffee drinkers uh, and so we, we managed to snaffle you in for a cup of coffee more often than not but now even though it is an option for you to run straight away please don't please come into the hall and join us uh, and share some coffee and chat together be part of the family it would be great to see you in there remember also um, tonight we have our evening service seven o'clock here tonight uh, and also 11 the 16s are meeting tonight and um, the uh, the study group is meeting on tuesday evenings for teenagers we have oh there's all sorts of things going on and remember to scar the aisles of tesco's uh, for all the stuff that we saw earlier and have a fantastic week and it sounds like adrian has are we going out this door so it's this door but do not turn right Keep going straight and in through the family centre and into the hall and we'll see you there. Oh, and pick up your children if you have some. Do that as well. That's always good.